Hello, dear digital ship friends. It's Thursday, 10 a.m. in UK. I'm your host, Vaida, and I'm thrilled to have you joined our 13th webinar so far. Soon, we will explore everything about interaction between ship owners and charterers with a special focus on streamlining processes and removing administrative burdens through digitalization. This webinar is brought to you by, in partnership with Cyber, a maritime software company from Finland. And here we are, we, with us, we have three great speakers, Melvin Matthews, Yuso Alanen, and Sebastian Sjorberg. And now we are jumping straight into the content with uh, our founding editor of Digital Ship, uh, Carl Jeffrey. Carl, let's get started the discussion. Okay, thank you, Vida. So what we want to do today is look at better ways to get the digital interactions going between ship owners and charterers. There's been lots of efforts to do this over the past 20 years or so, going back to the dot-com era, but you know, we're hearing people are still using enormous amounts of spreadsheets and emails. So there's a lot of manual work, and it also might mean that the ship's not being used as efficiently as they could be. And Charters are getting far more demanding in what they're asking for from the ships. They're, they're getting more involved about the CO2 emissions. They're looking more at the money they're spending, um, getting one to get input into the uh, speed and the, the routing. We're getting complaints. We're hearing about from ship crew that they're spending far too much time responding to email requests from charters, which might be taking them away from safety critical tasks. So but maybe now is the right time to get it all onto a digital platform. So um We'll review the current situation, look at the, the pain points and the, the flows of information we need and see how we might be able to remove the administrative burden and how to implement a system. So the webinar is sponsored by SIBA, which is a startup company based in Finland. They're developing a digital platform for coordinating and planning between the charterers, ship owners and brokers in the bulk and the break bulk sector to help optimize cargo flows and schedules. And they just got 500,000 euros funding from Lifeline Ventures earlier this year, which is a Finnish venture capital firm. So we're going to have three 10 minute presentations and then we're going to have questions and answers. So please load up your questions into the question and answer box. First of all, we're going to have Melvin Matthews, who's a former master mariner who currently works as a technical consultant based in the UK. Then we've got Yuso Alanen, who's a Business Intelligence Coordinator, Controller at Finlines in Helsinki. They have 20 Roro vessels. And he's a former business controller with the ESL Shipping in Finland, which has 14 dry cargo vessels. They say they're the leading shipping company transporting dry bulk cargo in the Baltic Sea. And finally, we have Sebastian Sjöberg, who's the CEO and co-founder of SIBA. And he's previously worked in sales and business development with BMT and Napa, and he studied Naval architecture, and he's a global leader from Alto Executive Education. So I'd like to invite Melvin Matthews to give his first talk. Thank you. You're on mute. Thank you, Carl. I hope you can see my screen. Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the digital transformation journey at a very high level in the industry. Um, it is actually quite fashionable to talk about digital transformation in the shipping industry and how it's going to bring unprecedented change. But the industry is also accused of being steeped in tradition and deeply conservative. And the strange thing is, looking back, perhaps I'm equally guilty of it. All right. I have a problem changing screen. So, um, what we must realize is that for an industry to transform, change has to happen across it, both horizontally and vertically. To begin with, onboard digitalization of the ships with sensors, for example, and then digitally enabling onshore managers and operators of maritime assets with the appropriate software systems. Finally, other stakeholders in the industry who are enabled by digital platforms that efficiently facilitate maritime transportation, such as ports, container yards, tanker terminals, etc. So in the shipping industry, whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, digital transformation has been happening, albeit uh, subtly, for quite some time. 
and it has uh, happened beginning at the grassroots. So what has been happening on board? Uh, remote and unmanned operations, for example, have been already happening for quite some time internally on ships. So operations of machinery have moved from machinery spaces to the engine control room. And I have personally been on ships where the engine control room is located outside the machinery space and co-located uh, with the cargo control room in the accommodation. On some ships, the engine control room has even been moved higher up to be located on the bridge. Uh, cargo operations are in fact not carried out in cargo deck spaces or uh, cargo pump rooms, but again, uh, located within the accommodation. So remote internal uh, working, if you can call it that. Now, technology to run unmanned engine rooms have been around from the 1970s, so roughly half a century. And the 1990s saw GMDSs being uh, brought in to simplify communications, uh, removing the highly skilled radio officers in the process. And for over 20 years, data platforms on board have been able to capture data from sensors and devices. Uh, equipment and machinery on board and send it ashore, especially with the development of modern connectivity and communications capability. So what is happening ashore? Let's perhaps review that. Um, computerization and ERP systems have allowed uniformity across different departments and uh, data from various reports coming from the vessels such as known reports, maintenance reports or incident reports are now received by experts, reviewed and archived a show. Unlike in the past, uh, analyzing data is revealing actionable insights into performance, efficiency, fuel saving, emissions, etc., while reducing delays, wastage and failure. Um, digital systems must of course, take into consideration uh, virtual work setup, especially now during the pandemic and uh, sort of the informational exchanges that happen informally. Uh, for example, when we go out for a working lunch or uh, the discussions that happen at the coffee machines. And uh, the picture below, below is perhaps indicative of uh, uh, managers in a crisis room, digitally tracking and coordinating with a vessel in distress or um, while uh, an incident is taking place. But uh, it can also easily be management team or board members in a typical maritime setup. And I certainly don't need to point out what is striking about this picture, but any guesses are of course welcomed. Now, there is no doubt that uh, the industry not just works in silos, but even departments within individual com uh, companies act in silos. Technology, of course, has made it possible to reduce uh, duplication while increasing visibility and transparency. And, and this is across the organization. But going digital, if not done right, can have its own downsides too. So software solutions uh, built to ease tasks and specific to certain departments can digitally entrench technical scheduling and chartering teams further and deeper into their silos, unless they are built uh, sort of ground up from uh, the point of interoperability. And uh, data-driven solutions also provide capabilities like anomaly detection, benchmarking, uh, tra uh, traffic lighting, which means that more ships can be managed by fewer people and certainly um, not on Excel spreadsheets as done in the past. Um, so uh, data has invariably brought visibility and transparency, as I mentioned earlier, uh, into, area, into areas that are previously unseen. So we now have regulators who can see uh, non-compliance and create new regulations based on measured outcomes. Customers have visibility and emissions uh, tracking and carbon footprint of articles and items that they purchase. And now armed with this new sort of environmental consciousness, the end customer is not just uh, expecting, but beginning to demand ethical transportation and sustainable transportation. Recently, commodity and energy traders have declared that they will disclose um, the, the carbon footprint of their maritime operations. 
and uh, stakeholders and investors are now demanding CSR and ESG initiatives and evidence that future regulations will be complied with. And uh, sort of an example of this is the uh, reporting requirements of the Swedish Stock Exchange and uh, the Poseidon Principle, uh, which is a classic example. Um, so what is happening across global supply chains? And, and this is important because uh, shipping is an integral part of it. So until early this year, there has been a great motivation for supply chains to work on a just-in-time principle with a strategy to minimize or even eliminate inventory. But the pandemic has shown that just-in-time only works in an ideal world uh, without disruptions, for example. But in reality, supply chains need to have the flexibility and, and sort of the resilience, uh, which only just in case can provide. And, and by just in case, we mean not eliminating in one inventory, but dynamically optimizing uh, inventory to absorb uh, supply chain shocks and disruptions. And this is impossible without real time data coming not just from across the industry, but from key points along global supply chains. And there has been a trend towards localization instead of globalization. Uh, and this means that disruptions may end up just being local uh, and not have sort of the global impact that it may have had in the past. And cargo is now uh, expected to be monitored right from the first mile to the last mile. And this is going to dramatically improve supply chain management and uh, it is impossible without real-time data clearly. And supply chains now no longer stop, which means cargo needs to move 24 hours a day without the need to adhere to uh, maximum human work hours or mandatory rest periods or take into consideration human errors, et cetera. And this can only be possible and achieved by uh, sort of going totally digital and with total automation. So um, if we look at commercial contracts, then most of modern commercial uh, shipping history has been based on charter party contracts. And traditionally, both the charterer and the ship owner have been dependent on the captain of the vessel to execute the voyage, of course, as per the terms of the charter party. And, and his reports and actions were considered of integrity and unbiased. And captains have therefore been sort of default um, as the final authority to take responsibility and sign off on important documents such as the bills of lading. And charterers, brokers, shippers, uh, consignees, et cetera, got most of the information directly from the captain or uh, routed through the ship owner. Now, uh, what is happening is that data has sort of turned this around and data is now freely available from various sources such as agents, surveyors, ports, when it comes to cargo, and uh, numerous other sources when it comes to the position of the vessel, uh, speed of the vessel, arrival times, et cetera. And real-time availability of data is creating uh, a new normal causing a structural rearrangement of information uh, and the trail um, that it is following in the industry. This is because data can be literally viewed by all parties um, interested at almost the same time. And this has significantly reduced delays uh, and corrections to errors and mistakes which can be made well in time. Now, another development is happening, which is progressive owners and charterers are building relationships based on trust, where they are willing to cooperate and work together uh, for better efficiency and performance of their operations. And data seems to have awakened a willingness to share and jointly tackle issues uh, such as emissions, uh, carbon footprinting, uh, environmental regulations, etc. So the industry has certainly been transforming for quite some time, but uh, some say the pace has increased with the pandemic in force, and it will be interesting to see how the future pans out. I would love to hear from the other panelists on what their points of view are on how the industry is dealing with digital transformation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Melvin. So we're now going to move to Helsinki and uh, going to hear from Yuso Alanen, who's the business intelligence controller with Finlines with uh, 20 Roro vessels. Thank you. Thanks, Carl, for the introduction and thanks, Melvin, for your presentation. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to talk a bit about 
commercial operations and digitalization. So focusing more on the, on the commercial side and the chartering side as well. So I've been involved in uh, some of these uh, projects earlier via some ship owners. And uh, these are a bit of my, my takeaways from those projects. So let's review a bit. Here's uh, what types of information we need for operation and chartering to happen. So you have your port characteristics and, and all these data that you have to control. And these are all information that can affect your decisions that you're making, of course. So there's a lot of different types of data that is, uh, that is key to your, your decisions. And of course, of your uh, operation to succeed uh, carefully. So you have your cargo characteristics, which are very important, of course, because that's what you're carrying. That's your customer, which is always the key, key part in, in making things happen. And then, you, of course, your own vessels and, and where they are and what they are capable of. You have your crew, your certificates and, and, and such similar types. And all of this data that is uh, spread around, around uh, different places. So you have it uh, around with the cargo owners. Some of you have it on your ship with the certificates. Agents, they have the information on the port and what is going on there. And then you have your crewing department, your technical department. There might be something very important going on with the crewing that you have your key personnel. Uh, perhaps you have some upcoming uh, changes that you need to make and then technical dockings or, or similar uh, that you have to really keep keep under wraps. That's what's going on. And then you have your operation and chartering on top of that, making sure that you're fulfilling your contracts and all your financial obligations, of course, uh, to the customers, but also to the owners, because they they have a lot of invested investments in in, in these ships and and the operations to keep keep up with with the demands of of today. So with the digital solutions, that's how you can help uh, bring these data and people together so that everybody has the same information uh, when making these decisions and, and, and fulfilling, fulfilling those needs. So what can you do with, the, with these digitalizations? So let's start with the planning of your project. First up, you have to decide on your project owners. Is it an IT project? Is it a chartering project or is it an operations project? So there is a, there's a lot of passion in shipping and there's a lot of uh, different needs, of course. Even though everybody is pulling for the same, uh, same team and same goal, but it's also very important to think about uh, who, who is the project owner, whose project is it? Because that will then decide that how will you approach your project and what is the problem you are solving because uh, it might be that uh, within the company there might be different ideas and different needs so it's very very important to think this through then resources do you have something uh, do you have some in-house resources that you can utilize do you have a let's say a big IT department or is it uh, that you have to take it outside it's it's not a it's not problematic in that sense that you have a lot of uh, different opportunities nowadays, uh, but it's uh, just a consideration you have to make because if you're doing it in-house, then it's usually on top of somebody's daily work. And then, of course, you need to allocate and take consideration that where they are using their time and money because, of course, you have a qualified personnel. So is it the, is it the best use case uh, to have them on this project? But also, uh, it's very important to have these champions within the within the company. Every time there's new technology taken into account, there will be a lot of doubt, perhaps a lot of excitement, and sometimes even a bit of fear. How will this affect my work, and will this change how I work? So it's very important that you keep everybody informed, but also that you have some of these key personnel that are pushing for this adoption of this new technology inside inside the company because then then you will really get the benefits of the of the new 
your new investment, but also that it will take all the personnel within the company that, hey, we are pulling together on this one and this will be a good thing uh, going forward. So that is also very key for this education part that you will have all of the users on board so that nobody will be, you are investing a lot of time and money for these uh, projects so that you will get most out of it and nobody's left left behind on, on these because people will have uh, different levels of uh, understanding of the IT projects or programs and, and everybody's coming from different places uh, in their life so it's very important to have everybody on board. So a short cycle of the project, how should you go forward? So when you're planning, uh, make a detailed plan and, and the, well the more detailed the better but, but so that you're bringing all the people together and you're discussing already what, what are your goals and how will you tackle these uh, going forward. Then your setup, do not skip on, on this part because uh, if you're making, making a new project uh, program and, and getting your data up to speed, that is very important that you're really taking good care of your, of your data and this setup because this is uh, something that you will live with in the future. So it's, it's very important that you will make this uh, a priority. And then you're testing. Uh, of course, you shouldn't uh, take some program to use without some test. And then you should get some feedback from your, from your users and amend accordingly. But also you have to document your cases, uh, perhaps for internal auditors or external auditors, depending on your level of company. If it's a stock-based company, for example, then you have to have a good, good auditing records. And then, uh, of course, this education and learning part, part of the project. That uh, from the start, you have an idea how you will take everybody on board and, and what is the, when is the time that you will get, for example, a certain group of people in. When is the, for example, if you have those champions uh, in the start, then you will make the more of the users going forward. So what is the onboarding plan for that? That is a good, good thing to note for in advance. So yeah, now that we discussed uh, that cycle and, and, and those kind of needs that we have. So my takeaway for, for some of these uh, pressure points, I would say that I have been involved in these uh, cases is, is definitely on this uh, data gathering and that setup phase. Uh, you will have then your master data for example, Melvin discussed of these silos. Perhaps you have your individual silos nowadays because you will most likely you will have some programs already. So now we are going to the second phase, let's say, of digitalization, or or you're trying to get more out of out of your projects. So then you will, I would at least advise to have this kind of master data that you will have going forward for all of your programs that everybody is on the same level. But then again. If you're on the same level, then, then there is the issue of whose data it is that you're actually using, who is the in control of this uh, master data. So there might be some different, different views in the companies. So be careful that you also discuss this in advance and take care that you have something that you're comfortable with uh, going forward. But also like uh, because of those different people, there's also different ways of working. Uh, the chartering and operations part of this uh, business, I would say it's a lot of people's business uh, still, even though you would say that <laughs> some of the contracts are really high value and, and you have a lot of uh, shipments going on, but it's still quite quite people's, person, uh, people's business. So it's uh, very good to, to discuss also that uh, your different ways of working with all those phone calls and emails and excels. So what are the expectations of the people and that you will uh, gather this data accordingly. And then have your test cases, real life scenarios, because the users will be much, much more involved uh, when you're taking it with the real cases. Uh, you can be provided, of course, some 
basic uses of the programs that you might be implementing or taking on, but also try to try to bring your data, your cases involved in there because when people see their own vessels that hey, this is my 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 vessel that I'm operating or fixing, uh, it's much easier for them to then take this new stuff into account that how to uh, leverage this new program. And then try to be agile on your resource management. So there will be points that on the project that perhaps not everything is going according to that plan, even though how detailed it was, there will be some perhaps uh, some uh, surprises on the way. And then you need to reorganize when needed and, and see how to how to get everybody back on track. So perhaps you have a steering group for the project or a project group, and then you have to put your put your thought into it that how will you make it happen? But be quite agile on that and not too fixated on on the plan itself, perhaps. So uh, but I would I would also like to talk then uh, you should be think about future proofing because as I said, you're perhaps on the second round. So make sure that your connectivity to the APIs that you have other programs perhaps you're connecting to so you get that data flowing. Uh, is it the cloud or server on site? Perhaps in the past it was more on the server side, but of course people are now working from home, different office locations. So perhaps think about of the cloud solutions and accessibility for the users. And of course, backups is very important for all those carefully laid out plans and, and contracts. And getting some data exports, how to get some uh, information with the PI tools and getting getting more out of that data because you are creating a lot of data on your daily work and when putting on those uh, those uh, information there. But why to do this investment in digitalization? Why to make these projects happen? So all the ship owners by now <laughs> pretty much have been done on the cost cutting. So now we have to get smarter. We need to make more with the resources that we have with the ships, with the people. It's more on this uh, efficiency part, better, less balanced and better utilization of the fleet. Also, like, uh, like mentioned earlier, we have a lot of environmental cases uh, coming up or regulations. And of course, officials uh, want to keep track of our, our fleets. And that's very good. So you have to have a good data governance that you can answer these questions to your customers, to the officials and so forth. But also the world is a faster and faster, as we can see from the cycle of information in the news and otherwise. So it's also applied to this business. So from factories of their production plants come to the shore side and to the ship. This is uh, really evolving a lot, this uh, flow of information and it's getting faster. It's it's not going to go slower anytime soon. So that's my my thoughts on, on this uh, area. So back to back to Vida and uh, Carl and thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Yuso. That's great. So I'd just like to draw the audience's attention to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You see we've got questions already from Gilberto de Sada and Carlos Losada, which we'll be discussing after the, the next talk, but uh, please load up your, your questions. So I'd now like to welcome Sebastian Schurberg, who's the CEO of SIBA, who's joining us from his yacht. So uh, Sebastian, please start your talk. Thank you, Melvin, Yuso, and Carl and Vida as well for arranging and, and for everyone participating in this webinar. So uh, continuing on, on, on the topic, uh, I will then uh, uh, briefly uh, tell about Cyber and uh, how we look at this and uh, how um, solution can, solutions on the market could, could support with the interaction between ship owners and chargers to, to streamline the processes and, and removing administrative burdens through digitalization. And uh, so, mm -hmm. Let's go into presentation. So uh, this is just a, a, a summary of uh, topics that we have discussed with the industry. I will I will uh, walk through this uh, more in detail on the uh, following slides. So limitations with the current processes and tools uh, in talks with with the, uh, both charters and ship owners and also other stakeholders in the industry, uh, specifically for the the, uh, the planning. Uh, phase so before it goes in, uh, into execution of delivering the cargo or transporting the cargo uh, the planning is, is uh, 
very often a, a process that is uh, done with spreadsheets. And uh, spreadsheets are, of course, very, very efficient. But when it comes to the planning, I think the, the, the limitation is, is reached in terms of, of uh, um, limitations with spreadsheets and also legacy tools, especially when it comes to, to uh, uh, lack of integration to external systems and all the data that is, that is out there today uh, available that uh, anyway, all the different people need to, to, to look at it in different uh, uh, um, solutions or, or uh, portals. And, and uh, in order to bring all this uh, information together uh, already in the planning phase, uh, we see that, that uh, there's a need, clear need to, to take that next step and the industry is, is ready for it, at least based on the discussions we have been having. And one thing is of course then related to very much that as well is the uh, administrative burden uh, uh, for, for the people uh, in this process uh, and the experts who are, are uh, uh, providing the actual additional value uh, with their expertise uh, into the process and uh, to improve the business. Uh, they have to be feeding in information manually to many different systems uh, in the different uh, departments, but also uh, all different stakeholders are doing the same. Um, so that's that's something which uh, we have, have noticed. There's a, a, a big challenge uh, to, to handle all that and to, to re reduce the administrative burden. And then then the, uh, the challenge with the industry, uh, if there's something that is for sure, is that everything is changing all the time. You might have a perfect plan, but then uh, uh, that is always going to change. And 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 uh, to be uh, to have something to support that process uh, uh, is is a uh, something that is, has been required or wished for. And then uh, how, uh, uh, in the in relation to this, how uh, to improve the business, what are the areas uh, uh, that we have looked into? And uh, one thing is, of course, uh, reducing ballast voyages and waiting time in ports. This is a, a big topic for the whole industry. And there's a lot of uh, different incentives uh, and, and uh, ideas going around and work done in that uh, uh, area as well. We see that that uh, by providing uh, a tool where you can do the uh, early planning and look at, at uh, uh, the whole fleet or the available contracts that you have uh, uh, for transporting, you can then, then uh, take one step higher up instead of having it divided into different uh, regions uh, where you have, uh, uh, or even different uh, ship types, uh, we are looking at a, a solution where you can take one step higher and look at the whole overview to make sure that you have a uh, uh, regional balance. So you have the ships uh, in locations where uh, uh, you have cargo for your fleet. Um, and, and also looking at the same time at uh, what are the opportunities uh, that the chartering department are negotiating, for example. Uh, so so uh, taking a bird's eye view on that process is something that, that uh, uh, would improve that process, both the ballast uh, uh, and the regional balance or reducing ballast voyages, but also uh, uh, combining that with the, the uh, waiting time uh, or reduction of waiting time in ports through communication and sharing the information to the different stakeholders. And also now uh, the industry is working very uh, on a, on a a very short term uh, uh, planning horizon, uh, whereas uh, a, a tool to uh, support the planning could extend that planning horizon and make it uh, more predictable. So that's, that's a, a, a starting point. And then looking at, at uh, uh, the different technologies, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and how to bring uh, uh, that AI into that planning process uh, to, to uh, improve the planning process or the system that is the, the planner is using. And then, of course, different optimization algorithms that, that are out there. Uh, we have a, 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 an approach where uh, planning, uh, providing a planning tool, which then uh, the user is in full of control of, and then uh, with optimization algorithms added to that, can then support and create different kind of scenarios where uh, uh, where this, uh, the, the planner get then to choose which scenario is best for each given case. And that's a continuous uh, uh, process. And then uh, also I have to say that uh, a big driver for the whole Cyber team is, is, uh, 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 is the potential to uh, provide solution to the industry 
developed jointly together with the industry to improve the efficiency and reduce emissions. And this is, of course, uh, a very hot topic. And we see that uh, a solution like we are developing and have developed so far uh, is very, very uh, uh, works very well for that planning process to make sure that there's there's a, a re uh, improvement in uh, how assets are used today. And that relates very well to, 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 to all these different regulations and, and, and discussions about the emissions. And, and we are very, very excited to be a part of this process. So uh, looking at the shipping process and all the different stakeholders where, uh, uh, who we have been, been uh, talking to, um, there is uh, a huge amount, and I'm not, uh, might be some, something missing from here as well, but everything uh, uh, is of course uh, related to the cargo and how to make sure that the cargo is transported in the most efficient way. And looking at all these different uh, stakeholders uh, uh, and all the communication that is going uh, uh, between them. Uh, yeah, uh, the communication today, yeah, email, uh, telephone, uh, different kind of applications and, uh, and so forth uh, are, are supporting that, of course. And uh, there's, I don't think there's any need for any uh, additional uh, uh, specific communication tools uh, rather than uh, having a, a, a planning tool which provides uh, support in the planning phase which is then combined with a, a possibility to share information to all the stakeholders around one cargo. So that's uh, uh, what we have been doing. So our solution is uh, uh, heavily focusing on the, the, the planning uh, uh, phase and optimization of that, uh, supporting, uh, uh, supported by artificial uh, intelligence when, when that time comes. Uh, and here, it's, it's not that we are providing a planning tool uh, only for, for uh, one stakeholder in the process. This planning tool works uh, for all the different stakeholders independently. Uh, 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 if you are a charter, a ship owner, even a port agent, uh, broker, whatnot. Uh, and, and we see that, that by providing that uh, 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 a planning tool, which has a, a, a world-class user interface and make that, that process very easy, uh, with the combination to share the information uh, in a controlled way uh, to all the stakeholders can then uh, make the utilization of all the assets, uh, not only vessels, but ports, uh, uh, storage uh, and whatnot more efficient. And also then uh, when it comes to the port, port time, there's interesting discussions going on on just in time arrival, where we see that, that uh, in the future when, when those kind of contracts are, are in, in place and in use, then uh, our system would uh, take that into account also in the planning phase. So you can do a, a more accurate planning and bring in all, then, uh, uh, all the information from the uh, uh, existing systems that is it then performance monitoring systems or, or uh, uh, other uh, port uh, systems uh, that have valuable data could be brought in, in into the planning tool uh, to support the planners. And then when all the changes are, uh, as we discussed, there are a lot of changes. Uh, uh, when those come in, then you have the right to, to uh, uh, plan a new scenario and, and uh, be as efficient as possible. And this doesn't have to be difficult at all. Uh, now, yeah, we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, optimization and, and whatnot. Here, I think the first step uh, uh, is very simple. Go, uh, going from an Excel or from a legacy system to uh, a, a very easy uh, to use web application, which provided us a software as a service that uh, doesn't require uh, uh, any, any big upfront cost. Uh, uh, it's basically a setup and then you're ready to go to do the pl uh, manual planning uh, to start with and then integrate to external systems to and enhance that uh, uh, planning. Uh, and, and then of course, with the optimization algorithms in place to, to then optimize. So there's, a, there's a, a journey the way we see it. And, and uh, as I said, it's very simple to take the first step. So that was what I was planning on, on, on uh, presenting. And now I would be very happy to, to uh, hear what kind of digital projects you're working on and how we could work together on that. Wow. 
Well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll go to the Q&A part of the session now. So I'd like to encourage everybody to open up the Q&A box, the bottoms. You can see the questions coming in. Um, I thought in the first four questions we've seen, there's a bit of a theme going on in uh, how do we get this stuff going? I think a lot of us have seen, remember the whole uh, in the 2000, the whole dot com stuff, Baltic Exchange, Level C's, Shipping Direct. We had a lot of companies trying to set up online ship broking and they all well, failed is a strong word, but none of them managed to do it. But they all had a very different business model, trying to take a 1% cut and be the ship broker. Well, we haven't heard anything about transacting here. We've heard about improving the communication and streamlining things. But you still have to get both sides to to do something. Maybe we start with, with you. So um, I think, think with your talk, it was a bit of a sort of unilateral of what a shipping company can do if it has within what's within its own power. But you'd also have to get a, a charter to agree to to do whatever you wanted to do, which would make the project very different. Do you, do you have any thoughts about how, how you get this going when it involves getting multiple companies all engaged? Yeah, usually the, the need is from the both parties, I would say that the charter requires faster faster response times or on data that how can you perform, especially if it's a COA partners that you have a lot of long contracts. So yeah, then there is, more and the involved on the both sides and how to get that up and running. I would say that there you will help also have these kind of uh, key personnel that you are working with, that they are quite open uh, on their discussion. And like I, I see in the in the Q and A that there is uh, this talk that about the sharing of the information and and perhaps in the past it's been quite that you keep quite under wraps what you have. But but uh, yeah, I can I could see it in a in a some uh, competitive sense, of course. But the, but the transparency is quite there, as as Melvin already uh, shared that you have these AIS and and different types of uh, information available. So I would say try to try to be quite open, uh, especially with your uh, trusted partners. Of course, it's it's about trust. Uh, this uh, you're trusting your cargo, you're trusting your vessel. So. Uh, and how to work those projects together. But there's definitely a need I've seen from charters asking uh, ship owners to to have a better seeing in their planning processes that what they have coming up and how they could fit and benefit both. Of course, it's a win-win when it works. Okay, we've got our three up votes for two questions from Nick Lambert. So I think this is the same Nick Lambert, who's a former Rear Admiral with the UK Royal Navy. So he's asking, has anybody got any examples where digitalization has given returns on investment? And uh, do you think it it'll have a reduction in the number of stakeholders in the cargo shipping process, which could be a place to have return on investment? I mean, I guess once we're talking, I, mean, I think you've given a lot of examples about this, Sebastian, in terms of the reducing the CO2 and the vessel efficiency. Would you like to start with that one, do you think? Yeah, I could start. Uh, uh, we, based on the discussion we've been having, uh, we see that there's, there's a, a, a common, uh, understanding of yeah that there will be savings we are of course in in that early stage yet so we haven't we haven't uh, enough data to 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 prove that but uh, the the way the discussions are going and uh, uh, the 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 way there are uh, there's the way they are operating today we see that that uh, by uh, having a tool to handle the planning in a more efficient way supported with the uh, uh, new, new technology and uh, also sharing uh, the information in a controlled way to the stakeholders that actually can can take take actions. Uh, uh, there is a great uh, uh, potential to savings, and uh, so that that's that's you know what we believe in, and especially with the optimization, there's no uh, optimization tool for for uh, with this approach uh, on the market at the moment, uh, and we see that that uh, there's a great potential, and we're looking forward to to uh, uh, to get the results. In the near future, and you've said nothing. Oh, you said nothing yeah. about cutting out the brokers, which is very, very sensible because the brokers. Yeah, right. yeah. I was just going to jump to that one as well. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't have an intention to to push anyone out. Uh, I, I think there are uh, now many charters and ship owners that are working with or without brokers. Uh, we don't uh, actually care uh, if there's a broker in, in, involved. Then he would be uh, able to use our system. Uh, uh, to help his uh, uh, daily work and reduce his administrative burden in terms of keeping everyone informed. Uh, so, so uh, because of uh, uh, our technical solution, it will not be, be uh, they will not be ex like 
out from the business, but uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, and, and when we get our first brokers to using the system, which probably will happen early next year. Oh, okay, so we've got two up votes for the next question from Gilberto Bissana. So we want to keep the industry software agnostic. So it's very hard to respond to that if you're an actual software company, I suppose, but uh, we're talking about data standards. Uh, Melvin, would you like to have a go at that one? You're on mute. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, it, it is a good question. Uh, I think uh, there has to be data sta uh, standards uh, if, if you want to do something at industry-wide level, uh, that's for sure. And uh, as far as software systems and platforms are con con concerned, there needs to be interoperability and they should be able to communicate with each other if you want to get any relevant benefit out of it. Um, and I, I think I also want to address uh, Nick's question, which is, uh, you know, do you see significant change? In order to see significant change and significant results, you need the entire industry to be uh, digitalized. You can't have one part of the transaction which is done on paper and signed off by hand, and then the rest of it, uh, you know, going through digital com uh, components or blockchain and things like that. So I think to, to, to see true disruption and uh, true change, the entire industry has to uh, sort of be digitalized on, on, on a, on a on encompass, all encompassing platform that uh, makes it very easy uh, and and creates a seamless flow of data. Oh, but there is incremental uh, you know, uh, improvements, which is why people actually opt for solutions and, and get digitalized. And I think, the, uh, like I said in my, uh, in my presentation, the grassroots have already been digitalized. So you have platforms on ships, the data started coming off. Uh, so key points along the supply chain has, uh, is getting digitalized. Oh, can, can a platform be, because standards are really, really difficult to make, but if you have a platform like SIBA, maybe everybody can use it and it can work together with other platforms and different software tools like we were talking about before, Sebastian, is this how maybe you so have some thoughts on this as well? Is this a, a way forward? If a yeah, I, I see I see here that, that uh, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, replacing or, or uh, not necessarily replacing, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, Something that is done with Excel today uh, uh, will be used on uh, uh, will be done on on Cyber. Uh, I don't think we we are going to uh, replace Excel <laughs> completely. Everyone <laughs> loves Excel too much and it's too efficient tool. But for the planning process, uh, we see that 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 uh, that is uh, something where we can bring value. And uh, all the other software providers in the industry, I see uh, more as partners because they are sitting on certain data as well. And that just enhances uh, uh, the planning process as well. So, so uh, I see there's there's space enough for all of us. Well, I think this top question, Ari, is is for you, Sebastian, as well. If a ship owner or charter buys your tool, does the other party get access to it through a portal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to write a uh, uh, reply on it, but uh, yeah, I mean th this. Uh, uh, the system works as, a, as such as completely uh, standalone for either a charter or a ship owner, uh, and that's uh, uh, for the planning purposes. Uh, but of course, to get to, to, to get the greater benefit from it, then uh, all the stakeholders around one uh, cargo delivery uh, uh, should be in, involved. Uh, but that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that every one of them have to have uh, use it commercially. They can be as a part of, of uh, uh, the. the uh, the stakeholders and just putting in the information, which in turn gives value to the other users. Well, you so would you like to have a go at the next one about uh, is the industry ready for data sharing? Considering the charters and ship owners traditionally have a very big lack of transparency. Um, I'm not sure what DCS and MRV are on a uh, DAG's comment below, but maybe. Uh, yeah, regarding MRV, it's a uh, monitoring uh, these kind of a. Uh, gas house emissions and, and coming up is more more, more of this uh, regulation from EU uh, going forward. So I think well, first uh, first for the data sharing. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so the, there's a lot of competition, I would say, in the industry, of course, and especially now that it's a bit of a down market in, in going on, then of course, everybody is trying to keep hold of what they have. So of course, the timing is not optimal, optimal in that sense. When it's a, and it's a bust cycle, then, then you're getting perhaps more, more on that, that side. But, uh, 
but I think also that that is the that is the future in that sense that uh, even if you would like it or not that uh, this data will be more more available going forward uh, but of course that's not uh, you can you don't need to share all of your data of course you have your inside business uh, data that that is up to you how you are running your ships your your crew and and, and these kind of items but of course if the vessel is open or not and and where it's going that is that is quite a quite a open information nowadays i would say sebastian do you want to try so alexander's asking about sanctions i suppose that's your next door neighbor big country i don't know if there's any relevance do you have any Russian customers or have thought of? <laughs> Maybe that's not a good question to answer. Feel free to skip it if it's not. A... <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so, sanction is not, uh, of course, something we we, uh, we are uh, in that sense aware aware of and and uh, uh, follow, following those whenever uh, they are they are active in, in in our cases or if they are. So, so uh, I would comment that, that on the other sanctions. Part a bit that you can use a uh, third party perhaps uh, uh, programs also to check if, if the counterparty is on a sanction list and that's definitely something I would recommend uh, if you have a, a Russian or some other businesses that are based based on countries that are under the sanctions list. Yes uh, from that perspective yes uh, in terms of uh, uh, sanction here is a, a, a good example of, of uh, um, external data that can be brought into the platform in that phase uh, uh, and uh, that of course has been a, a really uh, hot discussion the last couple of years in terms of, of uh, sharing that information uh, uh, to other systems uh, through apis as well and uh, that's something that that uh, we are very eagerly waiting for to be able to to uh, add different sources of data including uh, sanctioned data to, to to the process so the, the the users are aware of the risks. Okay, we have uh, six minutes left and seven questions, but uh, um, this is from Kumar Sundaram. He's the senior IT project manager with Anglo Eastern. Maybe this is for you, Melvin. Is it which, uh, in one minute, can you say which uh, specific areas do you think we're going to see more information sharing and who's going to take the lead? Um, I, th I think there's going to be a lot of information sharing purely because uh, the customers want to see more information. So. Uh, like I said earlier, there's now a requirement, uh, you know, even the Amazons and the Alibabas, they want to give information from the first mile to the last mile to the, um, to the end customer. So there's, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure from the likes of Ikea and people like that to have uh, more visibility into um, where the, you know, the end product is along the supply chain. So they have it, I think, covered uh, up to the sea leg and then after the sea leg, but this section between the sea leg is missing. So uh, I think people want to know where exactly, not just where exactly is the ship, but where exactly is the container on the ship and where exactly is the parcel within the container. So that's the level of detail that people want to get to. So I think there is no going back now. The more more uh, data you have, the better. Oh, I think I think the questions left are very in-depth questions. I don't know, maybe if I invite each speaker to select a handful <laughs> that they <laughs> would like to answer for two minutes each, maybe perhaps some. Um, if we start with Sebastian, do you, do you want to pick some questions and uh, share your views for, for a couple of minutes? Too? Yeah, there's an interesting question from uh, from Kors Sumker uh, about the, the regulations coming up and and uh, and and uh, so forth. And I see that this is something that that I think in order to be able to uh, uh, handle all these future regulations. Uh, uh, there will be so many different uh, uh, regulations that you need to take into account, and, and, and not only about the mission reporting, but others as well. And, and, and there, I see that, that another reason to, to uh, move forward from from Excel, which has its limitations, to a platform where you can actually uh, uh, build in the different kind of, of uh, uh, checks for regulations as you go in the process, so you don't you don't have, have to you know make a, a, a plan and then in the end it turns out that oh, okay uh, there's a, a, a challenge with a certain regulation so I think I think uh, that is something that we are very interesting uh, interested in, in following and and uh, the whole platform is built uh, from that purpose to provide notifications of, of, of uh, to the users and planners when when there are something that they need to take corrective actions on oh, you so would you like to choose a question to answer since I don't think we'll have time to answer them all 
Um, I mean, it's all talk about the ROI. I can see two questions about that. That's a... Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, for that, I would say also that uh, on the if you're going for a project, then in the planning phase, you have to already decide how will you uh, measure your success. So, for example, in the technical department, it's you have your uh, some uh, fuel optimization uh, programs, then it's quite easy to to say when you have succeeded or not. But perhaps when uh, thinking about this kind of planning projects or, or operational projects, uh, then it's more that your your personnel is more efficient also, and perhaps your fixtures can be a bit better. So then you should uh, compare it to that fixture that is missed, but how is that documented then, and, and, and so forth. So perhaps that is... Uh, uh, something to th think about when you're going through these uh, projects and of this uh, Royce. <laughs> oh, and, uh, Melvin, I don't know if, uh, any, any, any question you'd like to choose out of the, uh, out of the four? Uh, I'd, I'd just like to broad. add to what uh, oh. Yusuf said, and then that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, sort of results that you can't quantify readily. So, for example, uh, if you have, uh, in the past, people couldn't measure how competitive their business was or how competitive their company was with, with respect to a peer company, unless the company was listed and things like that. But now you have ways of measuring that so you know where you stand within. So if you're a tanker operator, you know what is your uh, profitability of efficiency with respect to the other peer companies. And, and that makes you, if, if you have a platform that gives you that kind of visibility, for example, that gives you uh, a measure of how competitive you are with respect to the um, you know, the industry that caters to that sector. So you may not be able to directly see it right away. So most companies think of ROI as a, what am I going to get in six months, three years? But I think it is much more than that. It's a measure of uh, how, you, uh, how you stand. Are you sort of mid-level in that sector? Or are you among the top guns, you know, top 5%? And if, you're at the, if you suddenly realize that we thought we were profitable, but the other companies making, you know, 2% more than us, then what do we need to do in order to improve our profitability and things like that? So there's a lot of visibility that's coming through and making companies uh, take actions which they wouldn't have even thought of in the past. Oh, Sebastian, do you want to take the last minute for any concluding remarks or ask any more? Anything yeah, else? There was some interesting question about that, uh, uh, multiple parcels and multiple ports, and, and uh, which is also a bit re related to the emission reporting since emission need to be reported uh, uh, for, for a transported cargo and they might have a combination of different cargos from different uh, uh, different uh, customer. And, and uh, that is something already from the planning phase, uh, the way Zebra works is we, we, we do the planning or it's possible to do the planning on parcel level. So uh, uh, any combination of, of uh, cargo on the same vessel and with multiple loading ports and multiple discharging ports is possible so you can follow that specific parcel uh, uh, on the different legs and then easily get the reporting uh, out from that as well. Wow. Well, I think we're time to up, so I'll go back to Vida for the final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, for a smooth uh, moderation. Also, I'm thankful for our speakers, Melvin, Yuso, and Sebastian. Uh, I hope we unwrapped uh, the interaction uh, between ship owners and chatterers uh, quite extensively. Thanks also, Sibor, for partnering with us on this webinar. And for the audience, I'm reminding that uh, next week again, we have uh, two webinars. Please tune in um, on Tuesday, one hour earlier than usual, 9 a.m. UK, and we will cover everything about 5G. And on Thursday, our regular time, 10 a.m. UK time, we will explore everything about uh, remote operations uh, and digitalization. Thank you very much. Uh, Digital Ship is signing off, and we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.